You were born in Katak city at the turn of the 19th century, to be exact, on the 4th of May 1900. But your paternal village is a fairly remote one in the coastal flood plains of Orisha, crisscrossed by rivers and rivulets. What memories and pictures of this physical and cultural landscape do you cherish? I was born in Katak in my maternal uncle Raj Das's house. At the age of six, seven, my memory says that I visited my village where I remember my grandfather who was a musician. My father had six brothers. All of them later became government servants. The village was very poor, though we belonged to a fairly prosperous family. I remember most of the doors in our house, which was thatched, was made of bamboos instead of planks. Many houses in the village didn't have doors at all. They used to have mats and tatis to cover the doorway. Everyone was poor mostly. Most people didn't have anything to clothe themselves except a dhoti and occasionally a towel. They didn't have much to eat. Most people didn't have two meals a day. Many people never knew how rice at all. They lived on mandia and uh, that too not often. I have not visited the village very often. Last I visited was about 10 years back. It has uh, changed considerably. The economic condition of the people has uh, had changed considerably. Well, sir, a lot of people must have come to meet you when you visited 10 years back. Yes, many people came to visit me. That's how I gathered the impression that most of the houses, most of the people are prosperous, more prosperous than before. For example, formerly, most people used to borrow rice uh, paddy for their food. And in course of years, when they could not pay the their debt, they lost all their properties, lands and everything. But recently, the business of lending paddy has completely vanished. There are no brick making in our village or nearby. Last I observed, there are many brick built houses. Of course, many with some with thatches and some with roofing. Generally, the people were better clothed and better fed. In other words, the economic condition had improved considerably. The one thing I, changed, I noticed particularly was that most men, younger men, used trousers and shirts. Then they didn't use dhoti at all. And most people, most young men, used shoes or chappals, which was a completely unknown in our my childhood days. I think motorcycle and uh, radio, maybe television may have come to the village. Television hadn't come. No, I'm talking of 10 years back. Yes. Television had not come, but uh, almost all households had radios and used to listen to the programs avidly. Would you say something about your parents and other near relations and the extent to which they had an influence and bearing on your life. My father was a deputy magistrate, which was the highest job that Indians could get in those days. My other uncles, six of them, later became government servants of varying positions. I lived mostly in a maternal and uncle's house, which was a prosperous family in those days. And their standard of living was fairly high, even under present day circumstances. My most important influence was from my parents. My father used to subscribe to the English journal, monthly journal published in Madras, named Indian Review. The Indian Review also published short biographies, cheap, costing about eight and as in those days, of the life of the prominent Indians of those days, like Dada Bhai Nauraji, Bairamji Jajibhai, 
फिरोज शाह मेहटा जी के गोखले तिलक एंड मैनी अदर्स माई फादर यूज टू बाय ऑल दोज बुक्स एंड वॉन्टेड मी टू रीड दैम विच आई डिड एंड रियलिस्ट रीडिंग माई मदर पर यूज टू गेट बाई पोस्ट द मंथली जर्नल इन बंगाली प्रवासी विच बिकेम लेटर बिकेम ए वेरी प्रोमिनेंट मंथली इन कलकत्ता इट वॉज बींग पब्लिश फ्रॉम अलाहाबाद इन दोज डेज she used to get it every month by post i used to read them because my mother had taught me to read bengali from my boyhood my mother also helped me to read the novels by bankim chandra and poetry of baikal madhusudan that's i remember many of them still those were my formative years what are the ideals or objectives that inspired you in school and college days and who were the ideals or the heroes it is said that today's students lack idealism that they do not respect teachers and indiscipline is rampant in educational institutions could you compare your time with today's to what extent do you think the malaise today is because of the fact that many students face a blind horizon with very little to inspire them in my days the ambition of young men was to be of social service to be important in society of course the chances were limited for example only hope a young man could think of was government service or practice of law or no other profession or calling was available there was no industrial undertakings in the country the only industrial uh, complex was the textile industry in bombay and some sugar factories in up and bihar so whole of south india was barren except a, one british textile company our ideals were mainly to be of service to the country in a vague way our heroes in those days were subhash chandra bose swami vivekananda and in many cases the terrorist persons who were hanged or in an attempt to achieve independence today the situation in the country is different there are amptins of industries and commercial undertakings so the question of employment is not so rare as it was in my days of course there are not enough opportunities for employment the balance today to my mind is mainly due to the injustice and oppression and corruption that is prevalent in at all levels of society for example recently we read of a case in which a chief minister of a state tried to alter the mark sheet of his daughter to suit the convenience of admission now this sort of thing was unthought of in our days i remember somewhere about 1950 or something there was a strike in ravindra college and three four or five students of college saw me in delhi they told me of instances where students who had failed to pass the entrance examination that means entrance to the college examination were admitted by the influence or recommendation of ministers some students were promoted though failing in the examination from for similar reasons i think the main malaise today is the rampant corruption in our society this is not confined to authorities or government alone but all around to what extent did you prepare yourself for your future public life while in college 
I did not imagine what it would be my public life because public life as such did not exist before the sitting of the Congress in 1920. All I prepared myself was in the Bharati Mandir reading room where we discussed all nationalist endeavors in different parts of India. Of course, at that time, Gandhi's program of non-violence had come into some prominence and that attracted me to a great deal. As I mentioned earlier, I believe, for an ambitious and idealistic young man, there is no other opening except for being a terrorist in our days. But with the advent of Gandhi, that part or that ambition vanished and started to believe that under Gandhi's leadership, we could achieve independence. And my preparations were mostly in reading magazines and books, particularly the magazine Modern Review, which was edited from Calcutta by Ramananda Chatterjee, and Indian Review in Madras, and Hindustan Review, which was published from Allahabad. Not many books were published, but certain histories, books of history, had become common in those days. Like the Sudeshi movement in India by Major B.G. Basu, a retired Indian Medical Service Officer of Allahabad. There is a Hindi book by Pandit Sundarlal, Bharat Mein Angreji Raj, which described the oppression of the British Indian government. My favorite reading in those days also were the histories of the Indian Mutiny of 1857 and subsequent oppressions. Those were the materials which molded my public life, which was mainly, which was given a turn by the non-violence movement of Gandhi. When was the house where you live now at Katak built and how? Do you recall? Oh, it was built somewhere about 1910. My father was the Tasildar in Banki in those days. Someone forget his name, he used to publish pamphlets in Odia, alleging illegal and oppressive acts by my father. My father asked the permission of government to prosecute the pamphleteer. Government will not take any step, but he could prosecute the pamphleteer and if his prosecution succeeded, that means if the accused were convicted, then government will pay the costs of the litigation. If the accused was not convicted, then government will take steps against him. That means my father. My father, after prolonged litigation for over two years, won his case and the accused was convicted. Government paid him rupees 20,000 as costs of litigation. And that was the basis on which this house in Katak was built. You got married in 1921, I believe. Was it an arranged marriage or you had any say in the selection of your life's partner? It was entirely an arranged marriage which my father arranged. I didn't have any say, nor did I want to say anything. My wife was from a village in Puri district. She was aged 14. When we were married, she didn't know much of public life or public movements. But soon she picked up enough to understand the Congress movement of those days. And fortunately for me, she did not object to my participating in the same. She has, all through our life, she has never objected to my activities. And she has managed the household and after the death of my father, the properties as best as she could. The upbringing and education of my children was managed by her. One peculiar phenomenon 
which I had not noticed at that time, was long before the estate abolition, Jamindari Abolition Act of Odisha was passed, about four years before, she sold off all our lands for whatever price she could get. But she always insisted the man who was the bhagchasi or cultivator that particular land would buy it, no one else. There should be no other competition, whatever price he paid. Thus, long before the abolition of Zamindari, she had managed to dispose of all our lands and today we are literally landless. And out of this uh, savings, that money which she collected by selling off the land, we are keeping ourselves happy. Right after marriage, you went for the law course under Calcutta University. What attracted you to this course? How were those years in Calcutta? My father, I had always relished that I should be a lawyer. After my BA, I went into some unsuccessful business ventures. My father was sorry about it, but after the loss of some capital, I, like a prodigal son, I came back to my father's wishes and joined the law college in Calcutta. In Calcutta in those days, the nationalist movement and the Congress movement were also prominent. In Calcutta, I used to do a lot of reading in the National Library, which present National Library, which was known in, as the Imperial Library in those days. And there I read mostly history of India, particularly of the British period, and also the history of France and the United States. Most of my time was spent in reading. I also casually worked for a French pharmaceutical farm, but that was just a side job. My time in Calcutta was spent mostly in reading and attending meetings which were addressed in those days by prominent leaders like C. R. Das, Subhash Bose and James Sengupta and others. I was fairly familiar with the Congress movement in Calcutta, though I did not participate actively in it. Do you recall the birth of your sons and daughters? Most of them are now respected persons in our society. Would you say something about them? I don't remember much about birth or upbringing because their upbringing and education were entirely handled by my wife. And if they are any good, it's all to her credit. All I can say is that my boys are all of them good men. There is nothing wrong in their career or in their life. They lead simple lives. Even my eldest son, who is a cripple, is also has edited, he has published many translations of books in English, which are published by prominent publishers in India. Beginning in 1921, Orisha came sharply under Gandhiji's non-violence, non-cooperation movement and the Congress ideology. Pandit Gopabandhu Das, Gopabandhu Chaudhary, Dr. Mehtav, Ramadevi, Navkrishna Chaudhary and many others were in this social movement. What was your association with this nationalist movement and how do you recall this period's activities? My association with all these persons were very intimate. Most of them were my relations, rather close relations. For example, Ramadevi was my cousin, the daughter of my mother's sister. Sarala Devi was my uh, uncle's daughter. Bhagirath Babu was my brother-in-law. Most of them were related to me. Mahatab, Raj Krishna and many others were close intimate friends of mine, all through from the beginning. I was largely influenced by the Gandhi movement and also took interest 
in this constructive work, so to say. After 1940 about, or earlier, I became the secretary of the All India Spinner Association of Odisha branch. Mahatma Gandhi was the president of uh, that association. And I used to take a lot of interest in uh, that movement and used to travel extensively over several parts of Odisha. And that was a very educative thing for me because there I came into touch with the poorest of poor in our country. Most of them, I particularly was impressed by some Congress workers who were rather Khadi workers in Sambalpur district. They were devoted and I remember one worker who, though suffering from malaria, would not leave his post. I went there to bring him to his home to recover. He was so loyal to his organization. That gave me an idea of how Gandhi can inspire men for utmost sacrifice and also how people responded to Gandhi all through. That was exemplified particularly 1930 salt movement. Before that, the British supporting papers in India and also in Britain used to say that Gandhi movement is dead, dead as a dog. No one will bark again. But the whole thing was belied because 1930 movement, salt movement, salt satyagraha movement, the response all over India from Kashmir to Cape Comorin and from Chittagong to Peshawar was astounding. It was startling to many of us even, those who were in the movement as such. It was in Chudi in uh, Orisha, I suppose, Barasa district. Yes, yes, in Chudi. And some other places, Kujang, many other places. And in fact, the greatest advantage of the Gandhi Urin uh, Pact was that most of the people of our coastal villages profited by making salt and selling them locally. I remember in my village, many people went into making salt and selling them in the weekly hearts, which gave them a fair income. Not much to talk of, but fair income, which was not existent at that time. But the fact which impressed me most was the response which Gandhi's call for Satyagraha evoked in 1930. That led to the Government of India Act of 1935, under which the provincial government and new provincial elections were held, and in which the Congress also participated for the first time in the elections. In Odisha, as usual, after the flush of the salt satyagraha movement, there is a lull in the public life. Gopavandu Choudhury and his wife Ramadevi had completely immersed themselves in a remote village in a flood-stricken area of Katak district. Dr. Mahatab was busy in Balaso and had become the chairman of the district board there. And as such, he was traveling all over the district, almost all villages. Navakrishnan Chaudhary had sunk himself in a rural area in Katak district, which was near Jagat Singhpur, and lived there with his wife, Malti Devi. There, he was instrumental in recruiting a large number of young men to this uh, socialist party movement. Many others took different activities, but the Congress main movement as such was at a, in a lull this till all India Radio the elections of 1937 came in. At that time, I was not much in the picture, though I was convicted for the first time in the course of the salt movement. Later, my father became sick and died. And I was rather burdened with many problems in the family. But in 37, Congress fielded 37 candidates only, because it was held under the franchise of the old franchise. And out of 37 candidates, all 36 won 
and one candidate didn't win because Gandhi himself wrote an article against him. Gandhi wrote that beware of beggars. This man evidently something in Bombay which had come to Gandhi's notice and he said that. The result was that in the elections every candidate won everywhere except this man who was defeated by the Raja of Madhupur. What was the term of your imprisonment? First term of imprisonment was uh, six months. And where were you housed? I was kept in the Hazaribagh jail. And there in the Hazaribagh jail, of course, most of the leading persons of uh, Bihar were housed there. But particularly the Khan brothers, Gafur Khan and Dr. Khan Sahib were also present there, imprisoned there. Now I was a very good worker in the factory, weaving factory of the jail. And as such, I had certain amount of freedom of movement inside the jail. Now, Dr. the Khan brothers were permitted to go for a constitutional walk inside perimeter wall of the jail at five o'clock. At that time, I used to meet them and wish them. Now, true to the jail rules, they never talked to me and I never talked to them. But it was a pleasure to meet them and wish them. That was great pleasure. Even prior to this nationalist upsurge and alongside it, Orissa's sense of identity was sought to be forced by Sri Madhusudan Das and the Utkal Samilani, demanding the formation of a separate state for the Oriyas, which came into being in 1936 and is in fact celebrating its golden jubilee this year. Did you have any role or association with this movement and its activities? The movement was founded and nursed by Sri Madhusudan Das, who was also a relation of mine. I was sympathetic to it in the sense that it was just, proper, that Odia-speaking people should be under one administration. But my main activities were concentrated in the Congress activities. And I was not quite active in that Odisha separation movement. Of course, it was very popular and many of our Congress colleagues, including one of the most valued colleagues left the Congress and joined that movement, Niranjan Patnaik of Ganjam. Swami Vichitranda Das of Katak also, though he did not sever his connection with Congress, was prominent in that unification movement. That movement attracted the sympathy of almost all Odia educated young men. But I was not actively associated with it. My whole energy was focused in the constructive work of Congress. The Odisha unification movement attracted almost all educated Oriyas of all ages. Mr. Madhusan Das was its founder and its leader till the last. One advantage the movement enjoyed was the tolerant patronage of the British government at that time. I particularly remember one Mr. Philip, who was commissioner of Orissa at Katak, who took a great deal of interest in that unification movement and helped it in many ways. Of course, it naturally attracted many of the men who were known as loyalists, that is, more loyal than the king to the, of the British kingdom. At that time, Gopanta Choudhury had settled himself in Bari, a remote village in flood stricken Odisha. There, he lived a very austere life with his wife and children. In fact, the life was so austere that Ramadevi became very sick. I had to go there and take her by palanquin to the nearest railway station at Jajpur Road, take her to Calcutta for treatment, where under treatment she improved. And that also helped Gopandu Choudhury to remodel his austerity program 
in the ashram. Then there, the Gandhi ji also had the correspondence about it with him, which I had seen. According to Gandhi ji's instructions, he included milk and milk products like dahi in their everyday diet. And uh, as far as quantity is concerned, three meals, three full meals a day was provided for. Later, at one time, when the Congress had been declared illegal, the hearts of the ashram were burned by the state of Katak district. And the joke of it was that one of the inmates of the ashram was convicted of arson for burning that, uh, those huts. And he was convicted to a term of two years rigorous imprisonment. Also, Navakrishna Choudhury had founded an ashram-like place in Onakya near Jagat Singhpur, which attracted many young men. There, they mostly spent their time in studying philosophy and economics. And most many of them later became active members of the Congress Socialist Party. And also many joined the Communist Party also. There was another activity which Bhagirati Mahapatra and Gopondu Choudhury had founded was an Alkasram in Jagatsingpur. It was like a school where many young men used to come for education. That ashram survived for about four years, but was later abolished. The Odisha unification movement also attracted all literate persons of Odisha. And the separate province of Odisha was formed in 1936. Those several parts of Odia speaking tracts were left out. It gave a great deal of joy to Mr. M. Madhusudan Das, the founder of the movement and who has nursed it from infancy to success. It was for the first time that an educated person like Mr. Madhusudan Das had gone out into the villages to preach the ideals of the Uttkar Samrani. It also gave a sense of identity to the Odia people, particularly those who were educated. After the unification of the Odisha speaking tax, the reactionary elements in those days, led by Zamindars and Rajas, expected to have a majority of seats in the Odisha assembly. Unfortunately for them, the Congress won all the seats except one which it contested. And the party led by the late Raja of Kanika lost heavily. I remember one candidate, Rai Bahadur Madhav Misra, who was a very honest, industrious deputy collector of Katak district, and to his credit had the reputation of eliminating the largest part of rivers which were, which were being choked by water hyacinth, which had become a major menace of the countryside. Yet, he lost his deposits in the elections. Congress, with its majority, formed the government. The chief minister was Vishwanath Das, I was one of the ministers and Sri Bodhram Rudube of Sambalpur was also another minister. In those days, there was much demand on the ministry for various reforms. But we had to choose the priorities. The first program was the Ganya Raitwari Rent Act, Rent Reforms Act which corrected one of the great mistakes of the previous regimes. There were Raitwari portions under the direct management of the collector along with those of the Zamindari. 
द रेंट पर एकर ऑफ द जमींदारी लैंड वेर समटाइम्स ट्वेंटी टाइम्स मोर देन दोज ऑफ द रेतवारी लैंड द रिफॉर्म्स एक्ट वॉन्टेड टू लेवल इट इन ओडिशा वी हैड ओडिशा टेनानस रिफॉर्म एक्ट विच गेव सर्टन राइट्स नॉट मच बट वाइटल टू द टेनेंट्स फॉर्मरली if a tenant sold his land to somebody the buyer had to get the consent of the landlord to the transfer now under the amendment act it was made compulsory for the landlord to recognize the purchaser as the new tenant all the buyer and seller had to do was to file notices during time of registration which was served on the landlord and that they have matter that was a great relief to the tenants of those days in fact the operation of these facts was that people were living in their own homes or houses and who had to grow on his coconuts the coconut trees there were deprived of the fruits the landlord used to take them this would take a long time to recite all the details but it did provide certain amount of relief to the tenants also one major legislation was the debt relief act which provided that should be leveled off at less than double that of the principal that is it should not exceed the principal and even there are some concessions that gave a lot of relief to many debtors one major crisis came in those days so the governor of orissa was going to england on leave for four months the government of india had appointed the revenue commissioner of those days john dane as the acting governor now the ministers led by the chief minister took the stand that it was improper that an employee of the government should be the governor even for a temporary period in those days the governor used to preside over the cabinet meetings the ministers threatened to resign if then took over government of india had promptly responded by cancelling the leave of the governor and cancelling the appointment of then as the acting governor later the chief secretary of madras was appointed as a temporary governor and there the matter ended but also the war had come in and the ministry resigned in 1939 i suppose on the issue of the war efforts but one fact remained that the general population was aware that the congress was their only true representative during the elections it was surprising to find that people without much persuasion came in crowds vote for the congress candidates and one significant fact which remains in my memory was that the cheapness of the elections i remember the in those days it was permissible for a proposer and seconder with the consent of the candidate to file the nomination paper with the returning officer now in balasor district the candidate who chose was unwilling to stand i went there persuaded him to sign the nomination paper and sent it by registered post to the returning officer that cost me except the railway fare and etc it cost me 4 ns because that was the rate of the registration at that time when i compare those days with present astronomical figures of the cost of elections i am surprised